Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Smart Grid seminar. This quarter we have invited Stanford postdocs to share the research with us. Our first speaker is Dr. Nicholas Astier, who works with Professor Charles Kostak, Professor Ram Rajagopal, and Professor Frank Wallach. These are the seminar presentations for this quarter. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Nicholas, who's been a postdoc here for uh, almost two years now, and uh, we'll be uh, going back to France and at the end of the uh, academic year. Uh, he's uh, on leave from the French Energy Regulatory Commission, which uh, for us is a real bonus. He, he certainly knows his academics, but he also has an appreciation for the regulatory environment within which electric power operates in many countries. <coughs> he has a PhD from uh, Toulouse in Southern France, Southwestern France, uh, one of the strongest uh, programs in uh, economics in, uh, in Europe, actually. His PhD was on uh, uh, the economics of modern electricity markets, which makes it particularly uh, relevant for our discussion today. Um, so uh, let me uh, welcome Nicholas, uh, who's going to be speaking on the topic of uh, distributed generation uh, and the need to network for network extension. So Nicholas, uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Shari. So thank you very much, uh, Chiwen and Shari, for the nice introduction. Um, so the topic of today's talk will be, it, so today's talk is joined with, um, is some work joined with Professor Rajagopal in civil and environmental engineering and Professor Volak in uh, economics department. And um, the topic we're interested in is the impact of distributed generation on um, the need for network expansion. So when we talk about distributed generation in the context of the electricity grid, think for now of uh, rooftop PV uh, and so each time uh, a project that involves rooftop PV makes it to the news. So for example, here this um, project in, the, in the New York City, um, which involves a lot of rooftop PV uh, that made it to the New York Times, you typically get this kind of statement that says, um, this project uh, will help the distribution grid um, and, and kind of alleviate the stress you might have on the electricity grid in general. And this kind of statement make a lot of sense because rooftop TV is located well directly on your roof where you do consume electricity. So you do expect that um, it, it has to provide some good benefit because it's gonna decrease the amount of load you, you consume. Uh, and so if that actually is the case, uh, that's, that's a huge deal. Um, because if you think of how much you pay in your electricity rate for the distribution grid. It's a very large amount nationally. So th this chart by the EAA shows uh, the capital spending, um, uh, well, spending in general in the distribution grid in the US for the major utility. So that's 70% uh, of the load in the US. And so what you see is, is that it has been increasing and uh, the order of magnitude is tens of billion of dollars per year. So if the above statement that when you install rooftop PV, you decrease the need for uh, grid investment is true, that's a huge deal in the sense that even a few percent improvement in how much capacity you need in terms of, um, of grid capacity can very quickly escalate to, let's say a billion dollar or several billion dollar a year in terms of uh, savings for rate payers. So that, that's a big deal. Um, the issue is from an academic perspective, uh, that's uh, when you actually try to assess to which extent this statement is true, so that to which extent distributed generation, such as with the observer, takes pressure off the distribution grid, it's very hard to converge on, on, on an answer, and it's a very highly debated topic. Uh, and if you compare estimate, you would get from, like, say, some consulting firm or some project developer to estimate you would get from uh, some papers in the literature or from other consultants, the estimated benefits can vary by one or two orders of magnitude. Uh, so there is no consensus at all whether this statement is true. 
And what makes this debate complicated is uh, that there is no real, uh, as there is a, a very big lack of empirical evidence that actually looks at power flow on an actual grid at a large scale and try to really uh, make this assessment of what has been the impact of adding more and more distributed generation to the grid. And so that, that's where our research comes in is like we managed to get access, very, uh, access to very detailed data for the French power system that enables us to uh, tell some uh, interesting thing about this question. Um, so the, the outline of the talk would be first some background to make sure that everybody has the same concept about power systems uh, and, and, and understand what we're talking about. Then I walk you through the approach uh, and how it fits well with, with the data we have. Um, a little more technical discussion on, on how we, um, we tackle our question from an empirical perspective and then result and, and discussion. I'll save some time at the end for Q&A and discussion. Um, but if there is some pressing question, uh, there is a Q&A feature and I hope Charlie will warn me if I, I'm missing an important question. Um, so if, I guess if you get interesting in, into power system uh, at a very high level, the first picture you will uh, encounter is this one or a version of that one. Uh, so that one is from the Department of Energy. But what you learn, the first thing you will learn is like the, dist the power system is a kind of, um, is divided into four pieces. You have uh, generation here, transmission, that uh, uh, distributes uh, gener the generation from power plants over large areas. And then once you get closer to load center, you step voltage down, uh, distribute to a distribution grid here in green, and you reach end consumers. So the, the reason why you will always find this picture is that, um, and, and why historically the power grid is organized like this, uh, is for the most part that um, in this piece here on the generation side, there is huge economies of scale of building very large power plants. So since we're gonna talk about France, let's take the example of a, a nuclear reactor in France. Um, so this would be uh, a three gigawatt plant. So to give you an order of magnitude, three gigawatt is like 3% of the maximum load ever recorded in France. So that's a huge amount of electricity that won't be consumed locally. You really have to distribute it over large uh, areas. And um, this is what uh, the turbine looks like. So um, there are two turbines in, in this power plant because you have two generators. And um, these things are huge. Uh, they actually have a name because uh, that, that are specifically designed for the station. And, um, and to give you an idea, this red cycle here would be a house. So th these are very big assets that produce large amount of electricity. So you need a transmission grid to uh, distribute it over large areas, and then you step down the voltage uh, to reach uh, end consumers. So given this organization, power flows are very straightforward. You generate electricity here, you transmit it over the transmission grid. Once you reach, so you transmit it at high voltage to decrease power losses, uh, but high voltage can be dangerous uh, if you're too close to it. So once you get closer to consumer, you step voltage down and you distribute it to the end consumer. So you get this top-down power flows from generation to end consumer, which is very straightforward. And basically all the architecture of the grid that is, has been planned with this mindset and, and this operation of the power grid. What changes with distributed generation is uh, that even though you do have some economies of scale, they are much smaller. Uh, and so if you take the most extreme example of a solar panel, this would be the power plant itself. I mean, you, you will need some invent, inverter and, and, and a few cables, but this is enough to produce electricity and, and you can literally hold it in your, in your hands. So this is, this is not this kind of huge scale uh, assets that we historically had with power plants. And because they are smaller, uh, you can connect them directly to distribution grid. So you would put rooftop solar here uh, on, on the roof of a, an end consumer, but they are different uh, distributed generation technologies beyond roof solar. So for example, a small wind farm would also be connected to the distribution grid or a larger, um, PV farm also may be connected to the distribution grid, but you also have like small hydro, like a small dam on a river that is a few megawatt will also connect there or small thermal units such as cogeneration or a waste uh, 
uh, a facility burning waste, for example, would also be connected there. And so now that you uh, start uh, injecting some electrons in distribution grid, this very simple picture of power flow going all the way down from generation to end consumers start to be blurred a little bit uh, because you have both generators and consumers here. And so what power flow look like here is, um, is less obvious than it used to be. So the first, the, the natural intuition is, okay, power flows are, are not straightforward, but since uh, you decrease uh, the net consumption because you generate where consumers are, this has to be good. Uh, and even though we don't really know what power flow, how power flow evolved, this has to be good. Um, the picture is not that straightforward because um, you don't dispatch distributed generation and for uh, distributed generation such as wind or solar, which are very intermittent. So this is, for example, the output of a random wind farm in, in France for a couple of weeks. Uh, output is, is very intermittent and not dispatch and that might vary across technology. So you don't really know whether when this uh, facility produces electricity, whether when this facility produces electricity, you actually need it. And, and since power grids are kind of designed to be able to supply electricity in the most um, stress moment, like this high demand scarcity event, you have no guarantee that it's actually, this distributed generation units actually generate when you need them locally. And, and that's an empirical question. And so the, the purpose of this work is, is to tackle this empirical question and to well, look empirically at what has happened in France and to see whether distributed generation has actually produced electricity when we most needed it. Uh, and we look at five types of uh, technologies. We get PV, wind, small hydro, renewable, and renewable thermal. Um, we get access to detailed data that I'll describe later. And because the, uh, the data is detailed enough, we, we kind of uh, are able to uh, draw statistically robust conclusions. Um, and so in a nutshell, uh, what we find is that we do find very contrasted uh, impacts of distributed generation on the need for network expansion, uh, depending on which technology we're looking at. Uh, and in particular, uh, we find PV and wind um, to be uh, pretty not pretty much not very helpful uh, during peak times, uh, like their uh, contribution in decreasing the IOS load level is very small or negligible for PV. Uh, so we, we don't expect uh, on average on the population of substation for France, a, a large impact. And uh, we also observe um, uh, an increase in the variability of um, the loads as seen by the transmission grid due to the additional PV and wind generation. And, and uh, if anything, this might in actually increase operational costs. Um, so at least from the data uh, we get, uh, we, we don't find strong evidence that wind and PV have a huge impact decreasing uh, the cost of uh, distribution network. So that, that's quick, uh, I'll try to, work through how we get to those conclusions um, uh, in the rest of the talk. So what we want to assess is uh, the uh, impact that adding distributed generation to distribution grid has on average on um, the uh, need for network expansions. So the best way to uh, talk to this question is to actually look uh, here at this substation that is at, at the interface between the distribution and the transmission grid. Uh, and so that's exactly what we do. We, um, we kind of uh, focus our attention on distribu distribution substations, which are this uh, red cycle here. So if you take real picture and not, not uh, sketch uh, drawings, uh, and you take the French electricity grid, which is the case study we are exploring, so this is France, this is a, uh, the transmission grid, which was in blue before. Uh, and if you zoom uh, in a given area, you would start seeing the sub-transmission grid in purple. And the unit of observation we're looking at would be these dots here, which are distributed substation. So um, those are facilities where you have a couple of transformers to step down voltage from the sub-transmission to the distribution grid. Um, so th this is a point where we observe load. 
And if you zoom further to the area that this substation is supplying uh, electricity to, uh, you start seeing the distribution grid. And so this distribution grid uh, is of course, cons uh, of course consists of consumers, but also of distributed generation. And so in this case, for example, you would have a small wind farm here that is connected directly to the substation, which is here. You would have um, uh, a wind farm here. And if you zoom down to the low voltage grid, you will also have like solar PV on uh, end consumer houses. And so what we observe is um, this substation here that aggregates all the consumption and generation from users downstream it. So all this wind, uh, wind generation, solar generation, and consumption from these houses and, and businesses that are here. And the good thing is that we observe over 2,000 sub substations for France at an hourly granularity. So we have the hourly dot curve for the substation, and we observe them over 14 years. Um, so that's, that's the first piece of data we, we are using. So concretely, what it looks like is if you take, for example, a week, you would have the load at the substation for each hour. So that, that looks like this, for example, for a given one over a given week. So that's a lot of uh, data points. That's over two, uh, 250 data points, two, 250 million data points, sorry. <laughs> and um, so we, we kind of structured um, the, the pieces of data we are interested in. And so we, we focus on two fundamental concepts in the power system literature, which are the, the load duration curve and the RAM duration curve, uh, which I'm, I'm gonna explain um, right now. I see there's a question, but I cannot see it. Okay, well, I'll pick it. For some reason, I cannot see the Q&A. Um, so first, the uh, load duration curve. Um, so the idea of the load, the load duration curve is a concept that is used quite extensively by um, power system engineers because it's, it's very convenient for practitioners. And, and the idea is very simple. It's from this um, raw data that I showed you, that is hourly net load levels. Um, what, you, what you do is you, you would sort them so in that case, in increasing order. So I, I do that for a week, but in practice, you would do that for one year or several years. And the reason you would do that is that uh, when you plan for uh, an electricity grid, what you care about ultimately is to be able to uh, supply reliable power uh, most of the time with a very high reliability. And so what that means is uh, you want to plan the grid to be able to reliable, reliably supply customers for very for the high load events, but maybe not all of them because like planning for everything is costly. So basically, what you would uh, choose as a planner is you would choose some reliability threshold p hat, and having ranked these uh, hours in increasing order of load uh, enables you to quickly assess how much capacity you need. So here, if you say I want a reliability of my grid of p hat. You can move all uh, all the way up to the load duration curve, and that tells you uh, how much capacity you need for the grid. And so we can build such a load duration curve for each substation and each year, and that that's what we do as a first block of data uh, we use to uh, track how the use of the electricity grid has evolved over time. And to give you some intuition, I'll, I'll get back to that later, but. Uh, so now if you imagine that you, you used to have a load duration curve, which is a blue curve here, and you add some distributed generation unit that produce a given amount of energy on average. Well, as a, as a grid planner, the, the impact of this unit is very different depending on when it produces. So if you imagine that it, it produces predominantly in, uh, in hours during which load was already low, so what, if it uh, shifts the lowest quantiles more. Well, you, you will indeed have a shift downward of the load duration curve, but the capacity savings you get here are pretty low. If, by contrast, for the same amount of energy produced, you shift the peak hours more, then you get much, much larger capacity savings. So you really care about when uh, distributed generation produced relative to how 
um, high electricity consumption was uh, in, is in, div in, in different hours for the substation. The second object we look at in this work would be is Audi ramps. So it, it's a more recent focus in the power system literature, which is actually pretty much driven by things we are observing in California. Um, so it's so far, it's, it's mostly a system-wide issue in the sense that it's um, this idea of the California dirt curve. So if you're not familiar with it, it's the idea that once you install a lot of solar PV, you get a lot of production during the day, but at sunset production decreases and load stays high. So you need to ramp up a lot of gas turbine to make up for that. Uh, and uh, you have to make sure that your electricity system actually enable that. Um, so what we are looking at is, is the same concept, but at the distribution grid level. Um, and so what we, we do is we take the, uh, the, the hourly net level of net load level of the, of the substation. We take first differences. So we just take a one hour versus, uh, minus the previous one. So for example, here, load is increasing. So we have a high ramp uh, upward. After that, uh, load is decreasing. So we have uh, a low ramp. And uh, by analogy with, with what we do with the load duration curve, uh, we also compute this, we also keep track for each substation in each share of this ramp duration curve here that gives you um, the distribution of ramp you have seen for this substation uh, by increasing uh, magnitude. So uh, here, for example, this would be the highest ramp downwards. Here's the lowest ramps down, uh, upwards and in the middle, uh, hours during which uh, load was relatively flat. And so at the distribution grid level, you don't really have this um, system-wide adequacy issue because it's handled at the ISO level. But um, you might imagine that if you start having very volatile flows, uh, that means that your uh, transformer setting will have to change quite frequently. That means that you, it might be harder to do phase balancing. So um, it, it's, I mean, you kind of want to keep track of this metric also at the distribution level uh, to get a sense of uh, how it's evolving over time. And um, so what, what is a good evolution and what is a bad evolution for the RAM duration curve? So again, if you take in blue the RAM duration curve for a given substation uh, that you had historically and you start adding some uh, distributed generation units, what you would like to see is some clockwise rotation of the ramp duration curve because that means that the highest ramps got smaller, both in absolute, got smaller in absolute values, both for the positive and negative ramps. And if you see a, a rotation in the other direction, that's that's not a good sign because you that means that you basically increase the magnitude of the highest ramps you're seeing locally. So that's what we keep track of in terms of. Uh, use patterns of the electricity grid. Now we have to combine that with uh, distributed generation. Uh, we have to, to be able to say uh, this load duration curve or this run duration curve has been observed when there was that amount of distributed generation connected to this substation. The good thing is um, the universal power plant if in France is, is publicly available since uh, 2017. So, uh, we, we actually observe each power plant. Uh, and for most of them, we observe them at the individual level. So it's one observation, one plant. And the data set reports uh, which distribution, distributed, uh, distribution substation this, power, this distributed generation unit connect to. So we can, for all the green part here of these pie charts, we actually observe perfectly where uh, a distributed, uh, to which substation the given distributed generation unit connect. Uh, so there are also these red and yellow slices here uh, for which we need to do some matching because uh, for uh, privacy reasons, the smallest unit, so if you have a rooftop PV on your, on your roof, uh, you wouldn't appear as a single observation in, in this data set for privacy reasons. So those are aggregated, which makes it harder to guess where they connect in the grid but we can form very reasonable guesses uh, about which substation they are most likely to connect to. And we actually run a bunch of uh, sensitivity analysis to make sure that it doesn't affect the result. Um, so um, uh, 
I, I refer to the paper if you have a question on that. But long story short, we are able to uh, observe very gradually um, the universe of distributed generation units and to which part of the grid they connect. And, and the last piece of good news is that uh, in France, uh, the amount of uh, distributed generation connected to the grid has been increasing quite a lot over the period of, uh, of our study. So between 2005 and 2018, we've seen a very large increase in the amount of uh, distributed generation uh, to the point where today, uh, at least in 2018, there was uh, roughly 28, giga, 28, 30 gigawatts of distributed generation. That's, that's about a quarter of the uh, historical peak load of the country, which is both very significant and it's also still pretty far away from the kind of install capacity you would need to get like very, very deep penetration of renewable kind of system. Um, because the total energy generated by uh, CVG generation is still a small share of the total energy generation. So uh, that's exactly the threshold where it's not being significant, uh, but there's still a long way uh, if you are, are really pulling this technology at a very, very large scale as uh, we set some targets um, for. And so to, to sum up, uh, the final data set we assemble is this combination of uh, grid usage on the one hand, so this uh, load duration curve for and render duration curve for each substation in each year, which we can uh, match to uh, how much capacity of each technology was connected to each substation in each year. And so having assembled this data set, what we are interested in is, is assessing uh, um, the, the impact that adding a megawatt of a given technology has had on average on the load curve and RAM duration curve seen by the substations. So if I get back to my example of um, you have an historical load duration curve, you add distributed generation and it shifts it down. So what we're trying to estimate is basically the difference between these two curves. So if you add one megawatt, say, of PV, and uh, it happened to shift on average load duration curve like this, the difference between these two load duration curve would be uh, this object here that we call like quantile impact function. Basically, it tells you for uh, each quantile of the distribution of hourly net load uh, by how much uh, this quantile has been shifted by the addition of one megawatt of this technology. So in that case, it tells you that I think one megawatt has had uh, a large downward impact on the lowest quantile, but not so much on the uh, peak hours. So you're not very happy if you see a picture like this. And by contrast, if you, if you estimate a quantile impact function that looks like this, and that tells you that for one megawatt of distributed generation, you get a large shift downwards in the top quantiles, but not so much in the bottom quantiles, then you're pretty much happy because that tells you that this distributed generation technology uh, um, um, elevates the stress on the power grid in the hours where it needs the most. So you, you, do, you do hope to have this, uh, this downward sloping uh, quantile impact functions. And for RAMs, it's the same intuition. It's just what, what is um, interpreted as, a, as good news is slightly different. So again, blue would be the historical RAM duration curve and purple, how it changes once you have added a one megawatt of a given distributed generation technology. And so if uh, you tend to um, make extreme RAM worse, and so, so you shift, uh, the duration as a RAM duration curve in that direction, you end up with an upward sloping quantile impact function. And that's bad because that tells you that the extreme RAM, both positive and negative, are um, exacerbated by the addition of this megawatt of distributed generation. And what you're hoping for is, is more downward sloping uh, quantile impact function because it tells you that the addition of the distributed generation unit tend to um, uh, decrease. Uh, the extreme ramp you observe on average at the substations. Uh, so in terms of econometrics, how we estimate that is, is, is very um, 
uh, is much more straightforward than the equation may feel like, but it's, it's basically just we regress we keep track of each quantile for each substation in each year for either the random duration curve or the load duration curve. And we regress that on the install capacity, uh, adding uh, a substation fixed effect and year fixed effect to control for uh, trend over time and a specific condition at the substation level. And the coefficients we are interested in are these betas here which tells you uh, the impact, the average impact of technology T on the Q quantile uh, of uh, either the load duration curve, if that's what this Q uh, keep track of, or the run duration curve, if it's a run duration curve. And so if you stack up this coefficient for all quantiles for given technology, so if you say like, for example, uh, T is T and you, you uh, stack up all these, um, coefficient for the main quantile, you kind of rebuild this quantile impact function I show you. So that kind of keep tracks of what has been the average impact of adding distributed generation on average on the uh, load curve or run duration curve based by, uh, served by substations. And so for the impact on the load duration curve, uh, what you uh, expect is this coefficient to be between minus one and, and zero because, uh, well, they produce electricity so they have to decrease load and they cannot produce more than the installed capacity. And so if you get uh, a coefficient of say minus two for PV for the 0.5 quantiles, it tells you that uh, for the av on average on the population of substation of Fran in France, adding one megawatt of PV has decreased uh, the, medium, the median hourly load level at the substation level by uh, 0.2 megawatt hour. Uh, and you have similar interpretation for the RAM duration curve where um, if you expect them to be between minus one and one because again, you cannot ramp up more than, uh, you, you cannot induce a higher strand than just shifting from no production to full steam production. Uh, and so uh, if you estimate, for example, a coefficient of, um, so beta point uh, 75 win of a point or one, it means that on average over the population of substation in France over the period we uh, look at, adding one megawatt of uh, wind has uh, increased the uh, um, third quartile the distribution of hourly run by uh, 0.1 megawatt. All right, um, so two sets of results, one set on the uh, load duration curve and one set on the run duration curve. So for the load duration curve, uh, I'll start with uh, non-renewable thermals. So this Think of those as a backup diesel generator or uh, gas-fired cogeneration units. And so the quantile impact function we estimate for those um, is uh, uh, kind of a uniform shift downward with uh, perhaps some uh, more production during peak hours, which is good news for the grid uh, and um, also makes sense with the fact that, uh, that uh, for example, gas-fired cogeneration units in France are incentivized to produce more during the winter, and that's when peak happened due to electric heating. So this, this curve makes a lot of sense and tells you that, um, well, adding uh, non renewable thermal distributed generation has on average helped uh, the distribution grid in terms of uh, how much capacity you need in, in the long-term equilibrium. Um, if you start adding uh, renewable thermal and small hydro to the picture, um, well, the bad news is now it's upward sloping, so they tend to decrease the lowest quantile more than the up, uh, upper quantiles. But you still get quite a significant contribution uh, in the uh, peak hours, so it does help a little bit. It's just uh, it tends to decrease load more off peak than uh, on peak. Um, and and the real Disappointing picture we, we got from the estimate we, we got was for wind and PV, uh, where we we got this like very um, concave and increasing functions, uh, where it tells you that um, uh, if we take PV to start with, uh, you get like a, a negligible, like statistically zero contribution to decreasing load during peak hours which is not super surprising in France in the sense that uh, we're reaching peak uh, in the winter when it's very cold and in the evening. So uh, it's, it's very unlikely that the sun is shining then. 
But I guess what's, what's more surprising is that it goes pretty deep in the quantile. So you, you really have to get pretty uh, deep in the low duration curve to start seeing an impact. And what was more surprising was perhaps for wind because wind generation is higher during the winter. So we kind of hope that we, uh, it would have a higher impact on, on peak load. It does have a statistically significant impact. So it, it does help a little bit uh, decreasing the need for capacity investment. But uh, it's, um, it's a very small increase. So a, a one megawatt increase will, on average, uh, yield a, a point or four uh, decrease in the 99th quantile. Uh, so that, that was somewhat disappointing. And um, the other interesting feature we get from this graph is on the other side of the distribution in the lowest quantile where we see this very large impact on the bottom quantile. So TV, wind, but also small hydro and, and renewable thermal, they tend to, to decrease uh, the lowest quantile of uh, the load duration curve, which historically didn't matter that much, uh, but starts to matter a little bit and, and will matter more and more. And the reason why that is, is that as these bottom quantiles uh, decrease, so the net load as seen by the transmission grid becomes negative. So locally there is more generation than production. So you start having uh, backfitting hours. So uh, power flow flowing from distribution grid to the transmission grid. And if this phenomenon amplifies, uh, at some point, this uh, reverse power flow uh, start to be actually uh, higher in absolute value than the peak flow you historically had in the other direction. And so they start uh, being a concern in terms of how much capacity you need for the distribution grid, because you want to make sure the distribution grid is able to deal with these very high local generation hours. And so uh, the, um, the substation where you observe this kind of phenomenon historically, so the substation for which uh, the peak usage of the substation in absolute value was reached during which um, was reached during an hour where power was going from the distribution to the transmission grid used to be very marginal. It was like less than 1% of substation in 2005 and that were like small mountain area substation where you had some idle and very little load. But we can see that this, uh, this has been increasing steadily. And as of 2018, you get uh, a, about 8% of substation where you actually, that actually reach their peak usage during the backfeeding hour. And, um, and this trend is very unlikely to stop because if you look at the number of substation for which uh, a negative that could happen at least one hour during the year. So there is, has been at least one hour where local generation was higher than local consumption. It has increased also steadily and now about a quarter of substation are like this. Um, so this, this feature that uh, you, de you, you depress the lowest quantile significantly that used not to matter that much uh, is gonna start mattering more and more because you would have to either invest in the grid or curtail or store, but you have to do something about it. Um, the second set of results is on the distribution of audio RAM. So again, RAMs are this uh, uh, vari like variation in uh, net load level over the course in, of an hour. So that kind of capture uh, the variability of the uh, uh, load profile that uh, a given substation is, is supplying. Um, and so what we find for thermal technologies and small idle is pretty much no impact or there's no statistically significant impact. Uh, which I don't tell, tell us much. But what's more surprising again, uh, and, and, and quite disappointingly, is that for uh, wind and PV, the uh, addition of more megawatt of wind and PV generation tends to rotate the curve in, in the bad direction, if you wish. So then that it tends to, on average, amplify the magnitude of hourly ramps you see, uh, you see locally. So for, if you take the, uh, 99 quantile or first quantile, adding one megawatt of wind of, or solar tends to, at least we estimate that it, it increased on average over the population of substation, the extreme, the most extreme RAM by 0.15 uh, megawatt. Again, that's some, um, uh, for small level of penetration that, that, that should be uh, largely manageable. The question is like, when you start reaching very high level, um, to which extent does that uh, does that affect uh, the operation of the distribution grid? Uh, 
and um, create some need for uh, expenses in terms of uh, um, operations. And, and to give you a sense of uh, what it means in practice, so that that's not a demonstration, that's pure anecdotal evidence, but if we take the, the substation I use as an example to explain what the low duration curve is and what the run duration curve is. So the blue curve I showed you was a, a given week in June for the substation in 205. And now the substation has added over 20 megawatt of wind and PV. And that's what the load uh, was in 218 for the same week in June. Uh, and so you kind of we choose this feature that uh, the impact on peak has not been uh, significant, and you get this negative hours of net load and this very large swing in in uh, power flows. But that's like just to give an intuition of what are the concrete impacts. Okay, um, so uh, hopefully the main takeaway that I introduced at the beginning of the talk are, are, are a little bit clearer now. So uh, the purpose of this work was to uh, um, uh, assess empirically to which extent different distributed generation technology uh, have decreased the need for network capacity in France uh, on the population average for the country over the course of uh, the past decade. And we find like, that the impact is very different from, for different technologies. And in particular for wind and PV, we, we find very little capacity to benefit in the sense that the impact on the top quantiles of the uh, distribution of hourly load level, so the white part of the load duration curve is, is more negligible. And uh, at the same time, they tend to increase extreme ramps. So if anything, um, they might even be more likely to increase the cost of distribution networks um, if we do nothing about it. Uh, we, we don't observe cost hierarchy, so we're not saying they do. It's, if anything, taken as face value without any mitigation strategy, that's what's most likely to happen. And, and we don't find such extreme uh, behavior for the other distributed generation technologies. Um, so the, the ongoing following work is, is obviously on mitigation because uh, what we're finding is, uh, is um, is adverse impact, which doesn't mean that the technologies are uh, not desirable per se. It does mean that they have this impact and we should deal with it. Uh, there, there might be a lot of good reason to install them. I mean, they, they decrease emission, they may be cheaper, they may create jobs. I mean, we, we're, not, we're not saying it's a bad thing to install distributed wind or PV. We're just saying that we observe that they create this change in use patterns of the grid and uh, it, it might be a good idea to get, take a deeper look at it. And so what we are investigating right now is to which extent battery storage can help mitigate that. Uh, and how does that compare, for example, to other traditional uh, approaches such as just curtailing excess generation or trying to get more flexible loads, uh, um, these kind of things. Um, 